morning. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Dulasi Yadati will defend in the academic thesis, small molecules, big consequences, novel therapeutic approaches for treating chronic inflammatory diseases. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Good morning, everyone. Dear Prorector, colleagues, members of the committee, friends and family. Today, I would like to share with you the summary and findings from my PhD thesis. In this thesis, we looked at the cause, consequence, and cure for treating chronic inflammation. To understand this, I would like to share with you the lifestyle routine of a person. So there is this person who, like many of us, wakes up and he goes to his office. He sits behind his computer and starts to work. During his very short lunch break, instead of going to the cafeteria, he decides to drive to a fast food center. He looks at the menu and he notices that there is one euro difference between a medium meal and an extra large meal. So he chooses the extra large meal and drives back to work. At work, he looks at all the missed emails the approaching deadlines and starts to panic. Consumption of high fat food, physical inactivity, lack of sleep, stress. These are all risk factors for causing disturbances in metabolism. Metabolism is a process that converts the food we eat into energy we need. Any disturbances to such metabolic process can lead to obesity or weight gain that ultimately lead to inflammation. Now, what is inflammation? Inflammation is body's immune response to an external threat. For example, when a normal cell faces, for example, or a bacterial infection, or when we have a cut, the normal cell becomes inflamed. And the body starts to respond to this infection by producing certain chemicals called cytokines. And the inflammation is resolved when the bacteria is killed or the wound is healed. Thus, inflammation is acute, meaning it is short-lived, and it is important to keep us healthy. On the other hand, inflammation can also arise from the food we eat. Certain kinds of metabolites can trigger inflammation in the cells. However, in this case, the response is persistent and inflammation does not subside which can lead to chronic inflammation, and clearly it is not healthy. The satiety regulation exists between metabolism and inflammation. Any such imbalances to this process can lead to metabolic inflammatory disorders. 
that mainly affect liver, heart. Although not completely responsible, inflammation is also caused by the food in the gut. Do we need to worry about this problem? Well, 25% of the global population have fatty liver disease. 17.9 million people have some form of a heart disease. More than 6.8 million people suffer from inflammation in their gut. The number speaks for itself. In the context of metabolic inflammatory disorders, in this thesis, we particularly focused on the liver. Liver is an important metabolic organ that helps in the process of food conversion and to get rid of toxins from the body. Consumption of high fat food can convert healthy liver into fatty liver, which is accumulation of fat in the liver that can trigger inflammatory responses. Untreated inflammation in the liver can lead to liver damage and liver failure. The range of diseases from fatty liver to damaged liver fall under non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We first looked at what converts a healthy liver into an inflamed liver. And we found that macrophages are mainly involved in this process. Macrophages are immune cells. In Greek, their name means they are big eaters. So they basically eat everything. They destroyed microbes, cell debris, et cetera, et cetera. They contain special units called lysosomes. Lysosomes basically act as recycling units of the cell. So they help in garbage disposal. So they have these enzymes that can break down many, many substances. Now let us try to connect liver macrophages and inflammation. So in healthy liver, the fat from the food we eat is packaged in the form of proteins and enters the macrophages where it is sent into the lysosomes. The lysosomal enzymes cleave this fat and convert it into cholesterol. The cholesterol now passes through this gate and is stored inside the cell. Cholesterol is important for our body because it helps as an energy reservoir. It helps in the formation of vitamins and hormones. Thus, everything is good here. In the case of fatty liver condition, due to oxidative stress, normal fat gets converted into oxidized fat. Oxidized fat is something that you can compare to a cut apple that is left open or the corrosion of the metals that you see. So in fatty liver condition, oxidized fat also enters the lysosomes in the macrophages. However, lysosomes cannot degrade oxidized fat. So it starts to accumulate in the lysosomes, leading to uh, fatter lysosomes, which ultimately leads to rupture of the lysosomes and release of lysosomal enzymes outside of the cell. Of all the enzymes, we found that catepsin D is secreted in high quantities in fatty liver disease. So in this thesis, we wanted to investigate if this catepsin D that is present outside of the cell causes inflammation by blocking its activity using small molecule drugs. But I just mentioned, catepsin D that is present inside the lysosomes is important to maintain cellular functions. So if there is a drug that blocks its activity, it can lead to toxic side effects. On the other hand, if you have a drug that specifically blocks catepsin D activity outside of the cell, we hypothesize that it is beneficial in reducing liver inflammation. To test this hypothesis, in chapter three, we have taken rats, we gave them high fat food for a period of three weeks so that they develop fatty liver. Simultaneously, we injected these rats with small molecule drug that specifically blocks outside catepsin D. After three weeks, we sacrificed these rats and we looked at their livers. The rats which did not receive any kind of inhibitor in their liver, as you see from the pointed arrows, showed higher deposition of fat, meaning that they have fatty liver. Next, the rats which received small molecule drug against outside catepsin D 
in the liver showed much less deposition of the fat, meaning that this drug is helping in the restoration to normal liver. So from this chapter, we concluded that specific inhibition of extracellular catepsin D can reduce hepatic fat content. Next, we wanted to see the effect of this drug on inflammation. For this reason, in chapter four, we have taken mice. This time we gave them high fat diet for a period of 10 weeks so that they develop liver inflammation. Along with this, we gave them two drugs. One that blocks inside catepsin D activity and the other one that blocks the outside catepsin D activity. When we looked at the mice which did not receive any kind of inhibitor, they had higher levels of fat in the liver. Also showed higher levels of inflammation, meaning that they have fatty liver disease. Next, the mice which received small molecule drug against inside catepsin D had beneficial effects on lipid content in the liver. However, they also showed higher levels of inflammation. Finally, the mice that received small molecule drug against outside catepsin D inhibitor showed beneficial effects on lipid content, also showed less amount of inflammation in the liver, meaning that it is beneficial in reducing fatty liver disease. In the same chapter, we also looked at what are the mechanisms that this inside and outside catepsin D regulate. To do this, we followed a proteomics approach and we looked at the level of different pathways that these fractions regulate. Mice which received intracellular catepsin D inhibitor showed repression of the pathways that belong to, belong to cellular function, meaning that such kind of inhibition can be toxic to the cells. On the other hand, mice which received outside catepsin D inhibitor showed repression of pathways belonging to fat metabolism and inflammation clearly meaning that this kind of beneficial uh, inhibition is beneficial. Thus, from these chapters, we concluded that outside catepsin D inhibition can be a very good target for fatty liver disease. If we go some few slides before, I mentioned that cholesterol from the uh, fat digestion goes via this gate and is stored in the cell for future use. In some patients, if this gets, a gate gets blocked, or if it is dysfunctional, cholesterol starts to accumulate in the lysosomes. This trapped cholesterol in the lysosomes can also lead to inflammation. To tackle this problem, there is already a small molecule drug that is present in the, that is being used in the clinical trials. This is called cyclodextrin. Cyclodextrin has a unique capacity that it binds to cholesterol that is inside the lysosomes and it can mobilize it out of the lysosomes independent of the gate. So in chapter six, we wanted to test the small molecule cyclodextrin for its ability to tackle metabolic inflammation. For this purpose, we took mice which were fed high fat diet and which also had this dysfunctional gate. We collected bone marrow cells from these mice and we exposed them either to saline or to cyclodextrin. We looked at two parameters, lysosomal size and inflammation. So the cells which received uh, saline or no cyclodextrin showed bigger volume of lysosomes under the microscope, meaning that there is still cholesterol present inside the macrophages and they showed some level of inflammation. Next the cells which were exposed to cyclodextrin under the microscope showed smaller lysosomal size, meaning that cholesterol is being actively exported out of the lysosomes. However, compared to the saline treated cells, cyclodextrin treated cells showed higher levels of inflammation. Also, the inflammation seemed to increase in a time dependent fashion. So from the graph you see here, the white bar indicates saline treated cells and the black one means cyclodextrin treated cells. And you see that after one hour, the inflammation starts to increase. This finding is important. As I mentioned, cyclodextrin is already in the clinical trials, which, uh, which means these findings are important and call for a careful reassessment of this drug before it is translated into patients. From all of these chapters, we concluded that 
cholesterol accumulation in the lysosomes is a major triggering factor for inflammation by releasing cathepsin D outside of the cell and blocking such cathepsin D that is outside of the cell or drugs that can tackle cholesterol inside the lysosomes are very important therapeutic targets for treating inflammation. Thus, small molecules have big consequences in treating chronic inflammation. That being said, prevention is always better than cure. So when life gets busy, instead of skipping that workout, eating all the high fat food, let us focus on running that extra mile, eating healthy, and most of all, taking care of your mental health that can have even bigger consequences in tackling inflammation and having a better quality of life. Thank you very much for your attention. I now give my word back to Proctor. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Honing. He is Professor in Analytics in System Imaging of this university and was Chair of the Assessment Committee. Professor Honing. Thank you, Prorector, for uh, the introduction. The dear candidate, um, I would like to congratulate you with this tremendous amount of work and giving us an insight in, I think, a world to be explored even more. Um, and I was looking to the tremendous amount of data and yeah, would like to discuss with you on that. But before, and I'm an analytical scientist, I'm, I'm very fond on terms and words. So your thesis is called Small Molecules, Big Consequences. And uh, for me, catepsin D is not really a small molecule. So uh, did I misunderstand this? Um, uh, a highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliment. Uh, catepsin D indeed is a protein that is bigger in size, but the, but the uh, inhibitor that we created or designed is small molecule. So that's that's why. Uh, so, so the thesis is about small molecules and not about catepsin D then? Small molecules that block catepsin ah, okay. D. Uh, and to continue, I, I would like to ask one of the uh, paranyms to uh, read uh, proposition number six, please. Uh, proposition number six, preclinical studies lay the foundation for drug development and are often monitored using big lenses. Their success depends on understanding where to focus and how to control the aperture precisely. Uh, yeah, here again, uh, big lenses. Uh, what does that mean? Um, more resolution? Uh, how big are these lenses? Meters or... So uh, when I was writing this proposition, it, uh, I, the idea popped up from, a, from a, a paper that gave a big review on how important preclinical studies are for drug development, but how often they are very strictly scrutinized because you test for toxicity, pharmacokinetics, availability, and et cetera. So big lenses means that, yeah, basically resolution, but because they are really magnify everything that we see, which is important because they are going to clinic uh, soon. Um, so, and I think it's important that you, uh, when, when, whenever we formulate these studies, to actually focus on those areas which are which can help in easy translation to the clinic. Uh, for example, in the first chapter three, when we had the first preclinical study, which was a proof of concept and a small pilot study, uh, we still had so many limitations, which we actually, I think, uh, saw under big lenses and then tried to correct them in chapter four. Okay, then I really understand the word big lenses. Uh, now maybe to the content, uh, or especially chapter four, and you describe uh, uh, so-called label-free bar spectrometry. And uh, I'm a mass spectrometrist, and I'm always working label-free. So why did you use this term? Um, I am uh, I am not a mass spectroscopy, but we did it with uh, with the uh, help of collaborators. Uh, I'm completely not sure of why. Uh, that is called label-free uh, quantification, but that's what that's the study we performed. So I, that's how I looked uh, at it. So you were misinformed by others. <laughs> so I would like to change that. So mass spectrometry per definition is label-free, unless you would like to do something. Uh, and a little bit more even in depth, and that's on page number 80. Uh, and then you described that uh, by the inhibition of the extracellular catepsin D, uh, you will get an increase of especially a P457 alpha one um, and 
that enzyme is particularly focused on the transformation of cholesterol. Uh, and then you claim actually that the uh, that this this uh, enzyme is linked also to the increased uh, production of bile acids. Um, so I, tried, uh, I, I I've asked myself, well, okay, it's a P450, so it's a hydroxylation, uh, hydroxylase, and what is it doing? And then I was looking to what the product is, and this is a free keto compound. And then I checked the bile acids you mm -hmm. describe, mm -hmm. and these are again uh, just uh, uh, free hydroxy compounds. So. I completely misunderstood how you think there is a correlation between the chemical structure of cholesterol and the chemical structures of these bile acids. How, how can you correlate them? Um, CYP71 is, uh, as you mentioned, is one of the uh, important enzymes that breaks cholesterol to, to bile acids. And uh, we checked for the bile acid, and then we wanted to see what happens to the level of bile acids in the feces to see if the cholesterol is being excreted in the form of bile acids. So we uh, we did a uh, um, FPLC and a HPLC analysis on the feces, and then we found that the, the primary as well as secondary bile acids are increased. And I think in most, these are uh, the uh, bile acids that are actually present in the feces, I mean, the excreted form. So that's how we correlated that cholesterol is being broken down and is excreted in the form of bile acids. Okay. But then I, I would like uh, later on to uh, have a discussion on you uh, with you on this, because actually the 7-alpha is only transferring the uh, cholesterol to one molecule, which is absolutely still not a bile acid. And most probably that bile uh, compound will be transferred to bile acid. But I did not understand completely the relation between that enzyme and bile acid formation. Actually, we also see a, a, slight, a, signif a slight increase in CYP27A1 as well, which is also another enzyme that can degrade cholesterol. That's why we wanted to look at maybe if it's the cholesterol is going in the form of bile acids. Okay. Yeah, because especially uh, also CYP3A4, uh, which is a very strong hydroxylating uh, for, uh, for, uh, so, uh, um, for drugs, is also upregulated. Yes. Yeah. I think a bunch of CYP enzymes are upregulated. Okay. Um, and in particular, also on the design of the study, uh, and I think even somewhere in the text of chapter four, you use low dose experimentations. And I checked, and actually, you're uh, uh, administrating 15 milligrams per kilogram. To, uh, and, and the other one also, and then I calculated, and that's uh, 3.7 grams of compound. And I eat sometimes a lot of paracetamol, but not 3.7. <laughs> uh, I agree agree with your comment that 50 milligrams per, uh, in, in my especially can be a bit more. Uh, uh, in chapter three, first we started uh, using this 50 milligram per uh, kilogram for this compound to check the toxicity mainly, because we wanted to give a very high concentration and see how the rats react. They were fine. Uh, also, uh, we used pepstatin A in the previous experiments, where we also used 50 milligram per kilogram. So in this chapter, we had two things in mind. First, to compare the study to previous pepstatin A, mm. uh, and then also to see if it's toxic and uh, if it actually causes some amount of toxicity. Fortunately, it did not have any toxic effect in the mice. However, I agree that we should still uh, do more studies with lower concentrations of the drug, for sure. Also, very interesting uh, discussion, but for later, I would like to give the word back to the project. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Fabig. He was a member of the assessment committee. He is an assistant professor in hepatology and river transplantation from the University of Leuven. And we are very glad that he took the time of being with us from our neighbors abroad. Dear defendants, uh, thank you, Prorector. First, I would like to congratulate you and your supervising team at your PhD, which provide an extensive collection of information on catapsines based on both literature review and also experimental work. I've prepared three questions for you. My first question is related to chapter three, uh, where you tested the effect of catapsin inhibitors in a Nuffold model for which you use the Sprague Dowley rats. However, I have an impression that the Nuffold phenotype of your model was rather modest, given the absence of inflammation and fibrosis. And in addition, correct me if I'm wrong, on page 60, um, sorry, 62, the control group seemed to have also a significant amount of steatosis. So my question is, if you could redo the experiment, would you use another 
animal model or would you change something in the experimental setup or not? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliment and for the question. Um, indeed, I agree with you that Sprog Delivets uh, are not a modest experimental model. Indeed, uh, they are actually used only, uh, they, they are considered as only obese model, but otherwise very healthy rats. Uh, so this is really a, a model that is used to test toxicity of the anti-obesity therapies. And uh, indeed, uh, on 62 page number, the figure A, as you see, there is a, not a lot of difference between uh, the amount of steatosis uh, in low fat versus high fat. Uh, two reasons. I, there are so many papers actually which tested this model with different weeks of uh, high fat diet and different strains, different suppliers, sex uh, difference, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so I agree with you that the steatosis was not heavy, uh, but this is only uh, HND staining. In the supplementary, we also did chromotropanilin blue and series red staining, where we saw that uh, there was a significant difference between low fat and high fat diet. Uh, Coming back to your question of what we can change. So the paper that I was referring to used 29 weeks of high fat diet. So we only used three weeks, but I think that makes a lot of difference already. So we can still, I think, use this model because it develops insulin resistance. That's the, also one of the uh, main characteristics. Uh, maybe we should prolong the amount of high fat diet so that they really develop uh, a lot of steatosis. So that's, I would start from there. And of course, uh, also increase maybe the cholesterol content on the diet. Thank you for your answer. Follow-up question on that, especially in a nuffled field, fibrosis seems to be the most important predictor for mortality, liver-related mortality at the end. So which other model would you use to test the effect of catepsin inhibition on fibrosis? Um, we actually started testing it already on CCL4 model, the carbon tetrachloride induced toxicity on fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So for now that we are continuing the studies on the CCL4 model, uh, we also have TAA model. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm completely not sure what TAA stands for right now, but it also induces uh, fibrosis. So for now we, we have these two models that uh, that we are currently testing. Okay, very I interesting. CCL4 would be a good one. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, because I read that catepsins, they have collagenolytic activity, which seems to be rather good. So what happens if you inhibit these catepsins? Or is my understanding wrong? You are, you are indeed right that uh, catepsins help, because also in chapter two, when we revise the physiological and pathological functions of catepsin, uh, as you said, catepsin D can uh, degrade collagen, which is important uh, at, uh, for normal activity. But I think when it is secreted out, or especially during inflammatory conditions, uh, it, it has more higher activity to cleave collagen and which can have fibrotic effect. So uh, I think if it's in high quantities, and if the activity of catepsin D is high, it's detrimental to the, to the cell. Okay, I continue with my next question. As you know, alkylated liver disease and nuffles, they do share common pathogenic mechanisms. Uh, in addition, patients with alkylated liver disease often do have metabolic dysfunction. So can you hypothesize what the changes would be regarding catepsin in patients with alkylated liver disease? And would inhibition have similar effects? Yeah, indeed, uh, alcoholic uh, liver disease and NAFELD share uh, path pathological uh, similarities. Uh, we tested also, I mean, one of the group, uh, also in, in one of, uh, in a group, we also focus on testing catepsin DS biomarker for different comorbidities. Uh, and we started testing uh, this in alcoholic liver disease cohort. And we found that uh, rather than levels, the catepsin D activity has been correlated with uh, disease progression and ALD. So I think uh, it already shows that uh, if, if it can be used as a biomarker, there is a potential to use it as a therapeutic target. Uh, we still are not testing it, but I think it's a very interesting area to test uh, the catepsin D activity. No. Okay, thank you. My last question. So is it time already to start a clinical trial with catepsin inhibitors in NAFL patients, or are we not there yet? And if not, what should happen first to achieve that goal? In all honesty, I think um, we are not there yet. 
because in chapter four, uh, we had really good results on hepatic lipid content, but there were still mild effects on inflammation. I would like to still see uh, what happens to inflammation as well as fibrosis in preclinical models and then uh, then translate the findings to the clinic. So I think still it maybe one more PhD uh, to test all of these uh, models and then maybe we can translate it to the clinic. But I think that's uh, really on the cards for us uh, because we're also extensively testing the biomarker, uh, CAT as a biomarker for different diseases, where it also shows promising results. So I think I would definitely like to uh, translate these findings to clinic, but some more years of work need to be done. Okay, I agree. Thank you for your answers. And I give the words back to the pro-rector. The opposition will be continued by Professor Browers. He is Professor in Endocrinology and Metabolic Diseases at this university and was member of the assessment committee. Professor Browers. Thank you. So dear candidate, I also would like to congratulate you and your team with very nice, nice work. Um, I would like to start off with a more general question. Um, um, with regard to NAFLD or more specifically with regard to NASH, we know that's all this that's believed that this is two hit hypothesis, two stage hypothesis is that first you have steatosis and the second hit is that you have inflammation. If I understood correctly in your thesis, you believe that oxidized LDL causes the second hit, the inflammation in, in NASH. So I was wondering, what, what is the evidence from human studies that this hypothesis has some clinical ground? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. Uh, indeed, um, NAFLD was believed and still believed to be a two-hit hypothesis but also the multi-hit hypothesis is already being tested, I mean, being proved in many, uh, many literature surveys and uh, book, uh, papers as such, so that there is not just two effects, but there are so many parameters that can cause inflammation. Uh, we tested it from a lipid metabolism point of view, and we found that OxLDL uh, releases catapsin D that can trigger inflammation. Uh, coming to your question of what is the status of this OxLDL in, in uh, patients, uh, I think more than in NAFLD, a lot of literature and a lot of articles have been published in terms of atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. which shares it's the same etiology. Yes. Uh, so uh, in wherever there is an oxidial accumulation in the atherosclerotic plague, I think that it has already been evidenced uh, in patients that it can lead to a uh, severe of disease. So, so if, if you, for example, would lower LDL cholesterol of LDL particles of plasma for us by statins, for example, mm -hmm. Is it known that they reduce NASH? I mean, statins are also, I mean, they are first line of therapy for lipid lower, as, as lipid lowering agents. Uh, they can be used in NASH. I think some people who have diabetic or have cardiovascular diseases are also prescribed statins. Uh, but I think statins also have side effects uh, in terms of prolonged use in diabetic patients, at least from the papers that I have read. So I think although they are useful, Maybe they are not. They have still some side effects with prolonged usage. Okay. And okay. They, yeah. So, so perhaps also due to time, perhaps we should move on to chapter four. Mm -hmm. um, so that there you did an inhibition of cathepsin D, and um, you already more, already more or less answered that question to with the, the previous one. Um, what you notice is that that uh, the amount of fat, so the first stage, mm -hmm. uh, decreased upon this inhibition. Did you did you expect that? That's my first question. The second is, what do you think the pathogenesis of what is the mechanism that this, this reduction of fat is? Yeah, so uh, we did expect that in chapter four that they, it will have an effect on lipid metabolism because that's how we hypothesize the whole catepsin D concept. And, the, and then I, I was wondering, that's always what I was wondering in thesis, triggers rise or cholesterol if you talk about lipid metabolism because that's a difference. That's true. Uh, so in steatosis, generally, it's about triglycerides. But uh, here we see more effects on cholesterol than on triglycerides. So uh, if that's uh, what your question is about. Or... But I think you did you did find a reduction in triglycerides, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Yeah. So do you, do you know what, what the mechanism is? Why does this compound also reduce the, the first stage of, 
of of NAFO? The yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, for the mechanistic point, so of course we expect it that there will be a reduction in the fat content. There will be an alteration in the in the fat content because that's how uh, we also saw with pepsin A with the previous chapters and also in chapter three where we had yeah. reduced steatosis. Uh, coming back to your question about mechanism, uh, catepsin is a protease, so all it can do is to cut proteins. So uh, in in the discussion also we uh, we had this uh, whole concept that it might target some uh, membrane receptors, for example CD36 or SRA, which take up the oxaldl. Mm -hmm. So maybe if it cleaves these molecules uh, or ABCA1, which helps in the cholesterol efflux, now they no longer function and then the cholesterol starts to accumulate. But it is just a speculation. We have not uh, yeah. completely tested it. Because CD36 also, I think, transports fatty acids. So could it be that yeah. the influx of fatty, free fatty acids is decreased, which mm -hmm. explains the lowering of the triggers rights in the liver? Could that be an explanation? Yeah, it, uh, yeah free fatty acid flux is something that we have not actively tested in the mm -hmm. thesis, but it's something that... I mean, uh, steatosis is, uh, is also characterized by free flat acid okay. flux. So, uh, yeah. yeah and, then, and then I was a little bit surprised because then in, in paragraph 3.4, you you measure the second hit, so the inflammation, so systemic uh, um, inflammation that is decreased, but you didn't find any effect on on liver inflammation. So, should we now reconsider this two hit hypothesis because triglycerides rise is decreased? So, I would expect, if anything. Um, inflammation should decrease as well, but that doesn't. So, so how do you explain? Should we reconsider that concept? Yeah, that's true. It was actually a bit puzzling to us because uh, we expect we actually expected the reverse that we see reduced hepatic inflammation than systemic, but also it was a bit uh, unexpected to what we uh, 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 hypothesized or what we expected. Uh, I actually think that uh, again, it might be a second hit. C coming back to the hypothesis, it might be uh, that it, it's first steatosis and then inflammation. But also, on the other hand, uh, we think that the the uh, because we collected the livers at the end of the ten weeks and then we tested at inflammation. Uh, one thing that we uh, thought about was the half life of this small molecule inhibitor we used. Uh, because it's, it has a half-life of eight hours, from 7.5 to eight hours. So maybe by the time we harvested the livers and uh, the, maybe the inflammation uh, effect was very transient, which is also something that we still have to improve because you want a, a, a good effect. So I think uh, that's something that we still, uh, that's why we say that it's only mild effect on inflammation. Uh, however, when we did the proteomic approach, we saw that pathways majorly belonging to inflammation were down-regulated because we did the okay. proteomics from the liver lysates. So I think something is happening, but it is not very profound effect. So and, um, and I think we should really increase the frequency of injections to see a clear effect. Okay, clear, yeah. satisfied. Let's give the word back to the pro -rector. The opposition will be continued by Professor Pirik. She's Professor on Inflammatory Bowel Disease at this university. Professor Pirik. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, uh, for the introduction. I also wanted to compliment you on the um, major amount of laboratory work, but also on the impressive number of references in your, uh, in your thesis. Um, I want to go more into detail into chapter five, of course, because my own interest is inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and um, we have been studying stress a lot in a large prospective patient cohort. So in the Netherlands, we follow about 5,000 patients uh, with an app, and we ask them to, uh, to fill out questionnaires uh, for stress and other uh, lifestyle. And, and what we found is that basically acute stress or an increase in stress triggers flares. So I, I wondered what you think is the mechanism um, or the, between um, stress and flares of disease um, activity. Do you think that is metabolic? Or is there another pathway probably more important? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliment and the question. Uh, indeed, uh, we have, uh, it's a literature survey in chapter five where we uh, try to summarize the preclinical and clinical studies which studied the effect of stress on inflammation. Uh, coming to your question on mechanism, um, we, in the, it's not very really black and white how stress actually impacts inflammation. Uh, not just in IBD, but normally uh, as um, I think in the in 
uh, uh, chapter five, we have different um, explanations, I would say, that for example, stress can induce, uh, change the gut microbiota composition that can also alter metabolism. For example, it can uh, treat, uh, alter the metabolism of neurometab uh, some metabolites that help in uh, formation of uh, hormones. For example, acetylcholine metabolism or tryptophan metabolism uh, that can uh, indeed affect the responses from the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So I think there is a connection, but I am not completely sure of the mechanism. So the bacteria might change the way these hormones are metabolized and that can cause, uh, that can trigger central nervous system to change the response. Or, but probably that is more a chronic stress related uh, effect than an uh, increase and then a flare in the two months uh, coming after the increase in stress, I think. Yeah. Do you think um, from a clinical point of view, because um, uh, in the same chapter you state that um, we need uh, more human st studies to, to study the relation between inflammation and, and stress. Um, if you have to design a study like that, do you, do you have a plan? Uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, because when we were collecting data for this chapter, uh, there are so many st uh, studies which already have uh, looked at the inflammation from a stress perspective, but the results are very really contradicting, either because the questionnaire that uh, was sent to the patients was had high variability, or the patients did not feel um, some, uh, it was not completely uh, filled out, or the practitioners had different criteria to answer these questions. So I think uh, I'm completely not sure about this topic, but I think the, of course, the first uh, about the design of the experiments, maybe we should really establish uh, parameters that are consistent between different cohorts. For example, if you say acute stress or stress, psychological stress or academic stress or work stress, so I think we should first lay out the parameters that we want to test and then standardize the protocol or the questionnaire that uh, uh, that is being asked to the patients and also the outcome. Somehow I felt that was very difficult for me to uh, um, consolidate because everything was had high variability. So I would start first thinking about how to make it uh, more reliable. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, that we have to standardize uh, how to measure stress, but in, indeed also the outcomes. And do you have any idea about the outcomes in most of the papers that you refer to? What did you think of them? Were they good outcomes? Did they measure information? That's more specifically what I'm looking for. Work? Yeah, uh, um, the outcomes indeed measure, again, most of it were uh, uh, the clinical studies were, that we mentioned in this thesis were the questionnaire, the quality of life or how they feel, uh, or they measured only the systemic inflammatory, I mean, the inflammatory cytokines like CRP or IL-6, which are, of course, uh, standard measures for inflammation. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would still uh, look at all the cytokines, but also... Um, more specifically, maybe we should design some, for example, if I say CRP, then we should at least try to measure it in all the patients and be consistent there. So the inflammatory cytokines. And if you were going to do a population trial, how many patients do you think you would need? <laughs> That's uh, very and, tricky. And how long would the follow-up be? No, I agree with you. I think um, you need to first find out what the mechanism is and find molecular markers eh, to, to design a good study and measure inflammation and not quality of life. But yeah. it was difficult. I was impressed by how you tried to make some sense of all these papers. <laughs> eh? So, yeah. My second question is about, uh, you are interested in small molecules and in the IBD world, we started to be really interested in small molecules uh, recently because mm -hmm. we have a new type of drug that's called the JAK inhibitors. So um, there are new drugs that are highly effective in inducing a remission that inhibit specifically the JAK1 or JAK1 and 3 pathway, JAK stat pathway. Mm -hmm. So they reduce translation of uh, inflammatory cytokines in the nucleus. But unfortunately, one of the side effects of these drugs is dyslipemia. And the same thing is, of course, true for corticosteroids, which is a, also a highly effective drug in inducing remission. So uh, what do you think of this? Is this a good way to go uh, there um, in inflammatory bowel diseases? Um, 
again uh, uh, Ketab Sindhi um, I'm trying to uh, answer from the Ketab Sindhi perspective again uh, Ketab Sindhi is being uh, is highly uh, also related to IBD where people found that it is secreted in high quantities in IBD patient and there is one study which used Ketab Sindhi inhibitor in a colitis model in vitro again and saw that there was a reduction in inflammation so to start off I think there is a uh, Pro, uh, good perspective uh, for Ketepsin D to uh, in IBD as well. Coming to the effect of small molecule inhibitors, um, they are very nice in some points. Of course, they can act very tricky uh, when you translate these findings. So uh, your question about uh, do we expect some um, effects? I mean, we have to test it in different, I think, to colitis models to see what happens there if, if there are any side effects. Uh, but also something that we are interested to check uh, in. And, and are you worried about the fibrosis? Dr. Verbeek was talking about uh, that uh, too earlier, because I think in most uh, chronic inflammatory diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and IBD, you say you have repeated flares, mm -hmm. and these flares will um, damage your end organ, and most of the damage is fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And then you get strictures in your bowel, or you get fibrosis in your liver, and then you will never get better anymore you know that's forever you need a surgeon to take a, a disease part out so are you worried about that with uh, with uh, catapsin uh, inhibitors um actually no because as i just uh, was answering the other question on collagen because catapsin d uh, we also expect in the in the ccl4 model that uh, the preliminary data that we obtained that it can be to some extent antifibrotic uh, so i do not expect that it can increase fibrosis uh, but it might rather reduce it. But again, it's uh, um, too much of an expectation uh, without the data, but I hope that it does not cause fibro. Because catepsin D indeed is involved in stellate cell proliferation. So if we inhibit it, I think uh, it will be antifibrotic for sure. Okay. Dear defendant, thank you for your answer, and I will give the word back to the board. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Jan Thijs. He is Associate Professor in Precision Medicine and he was member of the Assessment Committee. Dr. Thijs. Thank you very much, Prorector. And um, I would also, dear candidate, um, congratulate you with this uh, very nice work. Lots of data, lots of models, techn technologies or techniques that you use. So congratulations to you and obviously also to your um, supervising team. Um, you have been discussing here uh, this morning already NFLD, uh, IBD, so it will probably not come as a surprise that I would like um, to discuss with you on um, the role of the catepsin and specifically catepsin D in cancer. Um, and you describe here on page 41 in the review that you made on catepsins, a, a paragraph on, on cancer, on mechanisms uh, specifically, but I was wondering what is known of catepsin D specifically from clinical data? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Uh, indeed, uh, with catepsin D, we have touched almost every disease, alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, IBD, and cancer. Because cancer research is also one of the most important uh, uh, things that we do in the group. Uh, catepsins are, uh, as I mentioned in page number 41, they are involved in different types of cancer because they're highly active in tumor microenvironment, because these are acidic proteases, so the tumor microenvironment gives them more uh, a boost to uh, their activity. So uh, uh, particularly coming to catepsin D, um, a lot of uh, it has been tested in terms of breast cancer, where it is known to cleave uh, prolactin, and that's how it helps in memory uh, cancer. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I think also catepsin D is uh, involved in uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So I think these two are the uh, majorly where catepsin D is involved uh, in cancer. And of course, we would like to test first as a biomarker, actually started testing it as a biomarker in HCC uh, cohorts. And we see that it, of course, correlates with the disease activity. Yeah, I was a bit uh, uh, puzzled because now you mention uh, breast and HCC, but if I uh, read at uh, page 41, I see uh, breast, lung, colon, pancreas, skin, prostate, bladder, ovary, head and neck, but I was missing exactly HCC. So I was wondering, do you do you think, because you have shown data on, on in chapter uh, three, I think, um, on the use of catepsin D inhibition on uh, NASH, it has beneficial effects, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 
improves insulin sensitivity, it, re it reduces steatosis and so on. Do you think, or can you speculate on what would happen if you would use catepsin D inhibition in uh, NASH induced uh, uh, HCC? Um, yeah, as I said, catepsins are two, two uh, reasons. One, they're very active in the tumor microenvironment. They are very, uh, they are known to cleave the extracellular matrix proteins, and thus they are not just catepsin D, but basically all the catepsins, because they can cleave these ECM proteins. They can help in uh, metastasizing cancer, and that's how tumorogenesis. So I would expect that if catepsin D also follows a similar uh, pattern. Also, this catepsin D, there was a paper which said that uh, it it has uh, it participates in a um, process called a shedding, where it can help cleave the plasma membrane proteins that can uh, cleave the tight junction proteins and help cells to uh, metastasis and uh, uh, form the tumor. So I think if you inhibit catepsin D, I think it will have a great potential in, in uh, cancer as well, where it can stop this progression, especially the metastasis. Specifically then in, in or would there be a role in, in HCC specifically, or wouldn't it matter whether it's HCC or breast or ovary or whatever? Because I work on liver, I would start with HCC, uh, of course, bec uh, because we also had a cohort, as I mentioned, where we were working with the biomarker uh, thing. Uh, also in the breast cancer, because I think there is already a paper that published uh, in vitro and in vivo studies on breast cancer and HCC, where it was, again, it, it was with a general inhibitor of catepsin D, where they saw positive effects of this drug. So we would start with HCC and then maybe go to breast cancer. Yeah, and I think that that is important because I was triggered to say, well, there's been data with the general inhibitor of uh, uh, catepsin D, but you are... Um, aiming for specifically inhibiting the extracellular uh, catepsin D. Mm -hmm. But that was a bit counterintuitive for me because if you want to kill cancer cells, you want to use like something that is very toxic. And the extracellular, mm -hmm. as far as I understood, is less toxic. Isn't that uh, uh, a strange way? Because if we use chemotherapy, we want to use it, well, we want to use a drug that is as efficient, as toxic as possible. Indeed, uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, catepsin D inhibition, as I said, intracellularly is toxic to the cell, but I, I'm afraid to use these inhibitors uh, in, in treating cancer because it can inhibit also the cellular function. I mean, it's toxic, but it can also be toxic to non-cancer cells. So I would not use uh, intracellular catepsin D, rather we can use extracellular catepsin D. That's also what we're currently doing, that we uh, combine it with already existing, for example, chemotherapy or radiotherapy agents. And that's how you have inhibition of catepsin D in the tumor microenvironment that can also have effects on the metabolism, as we have seen here. Plus uh, uh, it is less toxic in other non-cancer cells. So I would still go with the extracellular catepsin inhibitor. And if you would not go, I agree, uh, if you would not go for the extracellular catepsin D inhibitor, but maybe for one of the others, is that would that be uh, smart to do? Because uh, there is so many different catepsins also being shown in, yeah. at least in preclinical studies, to be involved in cancer. During the last final months of PhD, that's what my supervisor was asking from me to look at all the other catepsins because I was only focusing on D and we wanted to expand our research to other catepsins uh, given the potential, especially in cancer. Good idea. <laughs> so uh, we found that, uh, I mean, we are currently focusing on catepsin B, uh, which is a prognostic marker for different types of cancer as mentioned in the review, as well as catepsin L. Uh, for now, we chose B and L, uh, also because we have uh, intra and extracellular inhibitors, uh, and we are also trying to develop this with the help of collaborators. So uh, we are going to test B and L to start with, and then we also plan to do catepsin S, because it is on also an antibody uh, that is available, which is being tested in the patients uh, in clinical trials uh, with the antibodies. So these three are in, uh, in the pipeline. All right, thank you very much. Do I have time for one more question or is my time finished? A very brief one. Well, a very brief because um, I would like to ask, and that is in uh, chapter six, so I make a small switch where you show that cyclodextrin can be in some circumstances pro-inflammatory. And I was uh, intrigued because it is now used, you have alluded to a little bit in your presentation, it's used in clinical trials. Um, shouldn't we immediately stop these trials? 
It's uh, indeed uh, cyclodextrin is in already phase three clinical trial uh, for NPC1 patients uh, who are three years and older, and the study is supposed to be completed in 2025. Um, coming to whether to stop it, I would say that uh, we still, I mean, uh, the data that I showed on the on the graph uh, is from the in vitro model. Uh, we only tested it in wild type BMDMs, so time dependent effect. So for, we would, I mean, before we uh, make a decision on the clinical trial, uh, we have to first test it in uh, several in vitro models and probably in vivo models to see if the time dependent and dose dependent effect stays there. And then also we have to monitor these patients for inflammatory cytokines, I think, because now I, when I look at the clinical trial uh, page, they said they are looking for the safety and uh, but they don't mention which parameters they are screening in the patient. So I would say that first they also maybe should consider uh, looking at the inflammatory profile in these patients. Okay, thank you very much. And I give the word back to the pro-rector. Your position will now be continued by Dr. Silero Pastor. She is a principal investigator of spatial anomics at this university. Dr. Silero Pastor. Thank you, Pro Rector. Um, dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you for this uh, wonderful work, of course, as well to your promoters and your husband and family uh, watching from India. So congratulate, yeah, thanks for, for uh, giving me the opportunity of being here, of course, but also I would like to congratulate you for this hard work of four years. Uh, so um, I would like to actually now move to my questions. Um, the very first one on, yeah, you mentioned in page number 11 that uh, liver biopsy continues to be the gold standard for diagnosis in the context of NASH. So, um, this is a big issue, of course, because this is quite invasive, right, procedure. So can you come up or can you suggest maybe new methods or uh, ways to actually, um, well, uh, be less invasive? And can you come up with perhaps, uh, or is there any data on uh, using urine or using serum? So what's your, your vision on that? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, kind words and for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, liver biopsy is a standard for uh, NAFELD screening, but also mentioned that there are also CT uh, fibro scans, which are also increasingly used to uh, look at the progression of NAFELD. But that's still uh, a bit less invasive than the liver biopsy because it's a scan and it's non invasive actually with the MRI. Uh, coming to the serum uh, and markers, normally we test uh, the levels of ALT and AST, the transaminases which do not completely reflect the disease pathology, but they are just as a liver damage markers. Uh, we also have cytokeratin that uh, was also being used as cytokeratin in, in, the, in the patients. But then again, we tested uh, our favorite catepsin D in terms of uh, as also as a biomarker for this disease. And we find uh, promising results there that it uh, actually correlates with the inflammatory state. So it can be used as an early marker because it, the amount of uh, activity and levels correlated with inflammatory state in patients and reduced after fibrosis. So we consider this can be a potential early marker for NAFLD. Yeah, for now, I think with the serum, you have the transaminases that they are being used. But is it specific enough? Because I can imagine that it's not specific enough for NASH, can be maybe uh, to any other liver uh, diseases. Um, at least in the cohorts that we tested in the pediatric population, adult population, uh, with uh, three different cohorts, it uh, clearly showed a specific effect on inflammation. However, we have not tested it in other cohorts or, uh, for example, other ethnicities or uh, which have other comorbidities. So uh, it's, I, it's hard to say if it's specific enough in those cohorts because we still need to test them. Uh, so I maybe we should come up with two or three uh, different catepsins and see how they respond and then uh, try to find out uh, what happens to catepsin day in this uh, in this cohort. Thank you for your answer. Um, now I move to chapter three, uh, where you do use an in vitro model. Um, you basically use macrophages, right, to, to study the mm -hmm. NASH pathology. And my question is, why don't you use hepatocytes? I know macrophages have an important role, of course, in, in in the, yeah, in the inflammatory process, but why not hepatocytes? Yeah, okay. it's uh, it, yeah, um, it's good. It's very interesting that we we also wanted to test uh, it, it, what happens in hepatocytes. But the reason we chose macrophages was because we all performed our previous studies, and we. Uh, 
have seen that OxLDL is more easily endocytosed by the macrophages. And because that's how our research question is that OxLDL triggers the cathepsin D release, uh, we always choose macrophages uh, as, as the mo model because that's how we, we think that if the endocytosis of OxLDL is uh, highly prominent in macrophages and in hepatocytes, but we would like to test Q for cells and hepatocytes as well uh, to what happens uh, in, in this disease model. Okay, thank you. Um, now about the uh, inhibition of catepsin D, you use this CTD002 inhibitor, mm -hmm. but I miss a little bit the structure of catepsin D in the thesis, right? So how are you sure that this inhibitor is actually specific, you know, to only catepsin D and not other catepsins and only the extracellular part? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, th this inhibitor uh, is, uh, for us, was developed by a company which specializes in the small molecule design. So uh, uh, to begin with, they have chosen the human catepsin D uh, uh, from the PDB, the protein uh, database, the structure that is being available, which was already docked to uh, pepstatin A. So that's the uh, background that they have chosen or the protein structure of catepsin that they have chosen. And uh, they develop these small molecule compounds that uh, only bind to the catepsin D that is present outside. Uh, of course, we do not have extensive data on uh, published in this chapter of if they're specific, but there have been a bunch of data uh, that show that it cannot enter the cells because of the... You can finish your last sentence. So, uh, so there have been a bunch of data, but this have a special moiety that it does not that that it cannot enter the cells and it stays outside in the circulation, uh, but of course many of it is not mentioned in the thesis. But we have the the data of how they uh, enter the cells, and in, how they uh, do not enter the cells in this case. Thank you for the answer. I give the word to the project. To last few dati, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
To Lucia Dati, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Svertlov is authorized to confer you upon you this ac academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to take now the floor, Dr. Sverlov, Professor Sverlov. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Yadati Tulasi, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. So, uh, to last see, uh, Tom will do the official audacio, but I really have to uh, take this opportunity to uh, say a few words to you and, uh, of course, to uh, congratulate Ipak and your family that hopefully are watching us uh, now uh, online. Uh, it's always exciting for Tom and I when we have to sign a PhD degree from someone from our group. But I think today it's especially exciting for us uh, because, because we both know that you passed a long way to come to this moment, right? So uh, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, Tulasi actually started to do a PhD already in India. She worked for two full years. And after this, for family reasons, you needed to quit. Most people I know at this stage will already give up and forget about their scientific career and dreams, but not you. You were determined to continue and you found the courage to move to a new country and restart everything from the beginning, a new project, new country, new room promotion team. And you never complained about it, not even once. I really admire you about that. I think you can be very proud of yourself. And um, the same level of uh, determination and target oriented and passion towards science also helped you when you needed to overcome scientific challenges. Huh? In the beginning, you wanted the project to be more mechanistic and you're not happy with that. And of course, other challenges like the COVID, uh, but you managed to overcome it all. Uh, you were always in the lead of your own project, also assisting other projects, being involved in many things that are ongoing in the lab. I particularly like the fact that you always initiated, always eager to study and learn, coming with new protocols, new ideas for experiment. You still do, by the way, even though she's not official member of our group, she still comes like, did you read this paper or do you want to do this protocol? And I think it's, it's really great to see. Uh, on a personal note, I really enjoyed working with you. Um, I connect very much to your uh, the, the strong link that you have with your family. We had a lot of discussions about that. 
also your very open and warm personality. It was a pleasure to supervise you. I'm very happy that you are in such a great group now in Amsterdam. I know you will be successful there as well. And um, I would like also to congratulate you on behalf of Yvonne that was part of your uh, supervisor team that cannot be here now, but she will be with us in the evening. So uh, now Tom will do the yellow that's here. Thanks. Dear Tulasi, it is with the greatest pleasure uh, that Rita and myself are standing here today next to you. Uh, because pleasure, that is uh, the word that first comes to mind when thinking back, uh, working with you in the last four years. This obviously does not mean that everything went uh, exactly as was initially planned, COVID pandemic included. But although some setbacks, your sense of humor and smile were never far away. You moved from India to Maastricht, as uh, Runita already mentioned. This meant a change in culture, in food to some extent, and uh, last but not least, uh, the outside temperature that uh, changed. That was a conversation subject that passed uh, quite a lot in the, in the first year, I can still remember. Uh, you were involved with, uh, with a whole array of uh, projects and experiments, only a fraction actually that, uh, that you actually presented here uh, today. This involvement with several projects shows obviously your ambition, but also your flexible character in terms of uh, scientific research. On the other hand, via you, we also learned, uh, we learned to know the Indian culture, uh, which I personally now associate with uh, being warm, kind, understanding, and obviously for very, very spicy food, which my poor sense of tone was not trained for. Hopefully, in the future, that uh, will, uh, will improve. Finally, I also like to say this. Besides that, we hopefully learned you uh, some things. I can for sure say that you being uh, actually the first PhD student that I am uh, a co-promoter of, also learned me some things. Patience, how to most efficiently uh, explain matters, and last but not least, that uh, throwing a bowling ball apparently also does not necessarily need to go straight ahead, but that can also go in the other direction, which is a technique that was also confirmed by your partner, uh, as you remember. <laughs> um, so lastly, overall, I can say for both me and myself that we are very grateful for uh, your ambition, your kind heart and your eagerness to learn which actually uh, has led to the PhD student uh, thesis that uh, you successfully defended here today. I'm very happy that you were part of uh, our research group and I wish you all the very best with, uh, together with Deepak in, uh, in Amsterdam. Dear Dr. Yadadi, also on behalf of the board of the deans of the university, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. And I would also like to extend my congratulations to your husband and to your family far away in India, who hopefully are still here with us and to join us in celebrating this very particular honor because getting a, a doctor's degree is the highest degree you can get at a Dutch university. So again, my congratulations. And thereby I would like to finish this ceremony. Uh, unfortunately, due to Corona, uh, we cannot remain here neither in this building. So I have to ask uh, the audience, except of course for your husband, 